Thanks, Ken. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's the continuation today of a series where we're carrying the weight of the words of Jesus in our life. And we're, we're in these words that we call the Beatitudes, and, uh, and we're learning, as Christ followers, what does it mean to live into these key words, right? These key things, these key phrases that Jesus spoke about. Um, so we're going to be diving right in this morning because I want to use our time well and wisely. If you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 5. We're still hanging out in Matthew chapter 5. Actually, that's where we're going to be for the next couple of weeks. We're, we're just going to keep going down the flow of this passage. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not used to singing and leading worship and all that and then preaching. It's been a while. Those of you who have been around New Hope, you remember when I did that every Sunday? You guys remember that? All right, some of you guys are like, whew. Okay, um, Tom, Tom has had the flu this week, so <laughs> we're like, all right, we're changing things up this morning. We're going to do worship a little bit different, but um, glad we could. Glad we have an awesome team to be able to worship together and, and just plug in and let's do this. And I, I hope that you guys um, worship, like that you really feel and sense the, the Spirit of God whenever we sing, um, because there's people that pray about it, work on it, and prepare all week long so that we can experience him in this moment. And, uh, and so I, I just want you to know that this isn't ever a thrown together thing. It's like, okay, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? What do you want to speak? And, and we, we take our time prayerfully going through and planning and uh, making sure that we're creating an environment for us to hear God and hear from God. Um, and over these last few weeks, we've done a little bit uh, different things throughout the gathering to help us do that a little bit more, like reading different scriptures. And thank you, Ken, you know, for leading us in that this morning and, and so that we can hear the word and, and just let it kind of soak in, meditate it on a little bit. Um, I don't know how often you get to do that throughout the week. I know some, some days I, I get just awesome, quiet time with Jesus and just like, whoo, really filled up. Some days it just doesn't work, right? Like I'm a real person, just like you. Life just goes, whoo. And I'm like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to pray in between everything with you. I'm just going to walk with you. I'm going to trust for your strength today. And so we want to create those moments for us while we're gathered together just to be still and just to listen, just to, to let him speak. So let's get back into this series Then Jesus said. If you haven't been with us, if you're just joining us for the first time, um, you would, I would encourage you, go back and watch the other messages. Because what we're talking about is one thing building upon another in this, in this passage where Jesus is preaching. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, I've kind of set the scene every single week that he was up on the side of a mountain, like tons of people all surrounding him, and he's teaching them what the kingdom of heaven is like. And this is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's like the big sermon that we see in the scriptures that maybe it's the longest one, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he starts off with, with like full power. Like, not pulling any punches, just like, okay, do you want to be blessed in life? And remember what we talk about blessed is, it's happy, right? It's satisfied, it's complete and content. Saying those people, if you want to be blessed in it, do these things or live out these characters in your life. And then he puts a promise on at the end, and you will experience this with God or God will do this in your life. So each one of these beatitudes, we continue to see that cycle. Blessed are the, fill in the blank, for they will and experience something with God, right? And, uh, and it's been challenging. And I told you guys, when I, I mean, I grew up in the church. I'm a Christian way, uh, just a long time. Since I was 12 is when I made a commitment to Christ. And, um, and growing up in the church, I've read the, the Beatitudes. I've heard them before. But I never studied them myself to this level. And so as I'm preaching them, for me, myself, I'm like, okay, there is just a level of depth here in, in the goodness and the graciousness of God. Um, that I was missing in these passages. And I hope that it's been exposed to you guys too being, as we've been through. Has this been good so far? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. Just a little bit of affirmation. That's all I need to keep moving. So, uh, so, we'll, keep, so we'll keep going. Uh, I, I want to, again, let's read through them again. I want to reemphasize the first part because if we don't get the first few verses right, if we don't understand our relationship with God in these first few ones, the other ones won't naturally come. Uh, the, we won't clearly understand how they get lived out in our life, okay? And so let's read it again. If you have your Bible open to Matthew 5 uh, with me, you can say, yep. Awesome. Here we go. So Jesus is up on the side of the mountain, and he's preaching. Verse 3, this is what he said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, if you remember 
A few weeks ago, we went through these passages and unpacked really what he's saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are those, it's blessed are those who are humble before God. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. It's humbled before God. What do, they, what do you experience when you humble yourself before God? Whenever you see God, his presence, his fullness, his power, and you experience him, humility should be the natural response, right? Like, wh- oh my goodness. Whoa. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we talked about this isn't just like if you've lost a loved one, like if you're mourning of a loss of something, you're going to be comforted. That is a true statement. God is the God of all comfort. He will meet you in those times. But in this passage, he's going deeper. He, he is connecting it to the first one. Those who humble themselves for God, blessed are those who mourn over the sin in their life. Meaning in God's presence, they're humbled and they realize they are not perfect. They, they, we all have messes, right? We all have sin in our life. And he said, blessed are those who, who mourn in that, realizing that they really have nothing great to bring to God. Now, does that mean that you have no value? No. God loves you, right? God, God did everything so that in that mourning of the sin in our lives, he meets us there. He comforts us there. He wants a relationship with us there. He loves you. But but what he's pushing against in these first few passages is pride. Because the natural state of mankind is pride. It's pride in yourself, pride in your experience, pride. And today in our culture, pride is of high value. Self-worth, self-esteem is of high value, and it gets actually valued higher than God's truth. And I talked about that cultural piece right now, especially this generation that's coming up. The value of what they think, how they feel, what they say, and what they post out there is more important than what God says in their life. Whoa, that's a dangerous place to be, according to what Jesus is saying. Like, those who are humbled before God, you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn because of the sin in their life, because they've seen God— He says, I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to comfort you. He says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And meekness, right, is is another word for humility. It's being others-centered rather than self-centered in life. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. That's what I said, right? Jesus was meek, but he was strong. And so when we think about meekness, it just continues the path of humility, serving others, thinking of others, being there for others, rather than protecting or promoting or being all about self. That's meekness. And then he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And man, if I want that in my life. I want to be hungry for the righteousness of God more than anything else. I want to hunger and thirst for him every day. Because in that hunger, he promises you will be filled. You'll be filled with him. You'll be filled with his presence. You'll be filled with his work in your life. You'll be filled up. That's powerful, to be filled. And then we talked about blessed are those who are merciful, for they will show mercy. And merciful just simply meant compassionate, right? It's having a heart for other people and being moved by their circumstances. Being merciful to other people. It's not being, it's opposite of being judgmental, opposite of like condemning. Like merciful is like, man, I feel what you're going through. I'm not judging you for it. I'm not saying, boy, you're a stupid person. Like, anybody ever have those thoughts? I'm just wondering, right? Like, there's people in our lives that we wrestle with these things for real, at work, right? At school, at home. Like, these, Jesus knew what he was talking about. He's like, no, no, be merciful. Why? Because I've given you mercy. I look at you and, I, and Jesus, like, God could look at us and say, oh, why did they do that again? Right? Like, he could, he could shake his head, but he looks at us and he says, I'm showing you mercy, because I love you. I'm just asking you to show mercy to others because I love them too, right? And then verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And this is the image that those who are, don't have their hearts divided, right? Pure of heart means my heart is focused. I'm centered. I'm centered on God. I'm not like for God sometimes and then for the world sometimes, for myself sometimes. And God's kind of in the mix somewhere. It's like, no, blessed are those who are, are single-minded, single-focused, single-hearted with God and what he wants in their life. So we see these first few ones, and they are all, all of them, every single one of them is wrapped around this mentality and this heartbeat, this thing that Jesus preaches on of humility. Humility. And, uh, and I know I used a couple of illustrations last week. One, one I talked about that humbling process is like us being a pitcher of water, and that water just being, if it, when it's full of my junk, it's not clear, right? It's dirty, it's messy, it's mucky. I know that about my life. 
And for me to come to God and see him and say, oh, my pitcher is nasty. I know it is before you. And, and that humbling process of mourning is pouring myself out to him, saying, God, I don't want this so that I can have him fill me up with him, right? It's that humbling process where he meets us, shows compassion to us. He fills us back up with him. I use this other picture of God when we come before the God of the universe that, that for us, we come to him as a beggar who has nothing to give him. And I'm not saying that as in a humiliating phrase. I'm saying it as a humbling phrase. Like, what can I give to the God who has no need, who has everything, who has all power? I'm a beggar saying, God, I need you. And God is the one who has everything to give and has. I wanted to read a passage to help us understand this, just because this is the last of these Beatitudes, okay? So I want to know that we know what, what I'm talking about here. Because there's another point, part where Jesus was teaching, and he was teaching again to the Pharisees, the religious of the day. And, uh, and he wanted to teach them through a story, right? That, that's what he did. He used a lot of parables. Let me tell you a story that will connect with you so you can understand, right? And, that, and that's, Jesus was a brilliant teacher. Brilliant. To pull people into the kingdom of heaven. And so, so he goes in Luke 18, and he's talking to this crowd, and he's teaching them the same idea. He says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So he's looking at the, the people who are full of pride, you know, full, full of arrogance, self-righteousness. And he tells this story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Just so you know, in that day, tax collectors, they were bad, right? Like when, whenever you see that in the New Testament, it's not like tax collector, he was just doing his job. It's like no tax collector, like he's scandalous, he's stealing money, he's taking whatever he wants and he's giving to the king whatever the king needs, but he's keeping the rest and like just, just low, you know, low in society. But rich, <laughs> like because he was loaded, right? So the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He like calls this guy out. He's like, God, thank you that I'm not like that guy, right? I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. He's like, look at me, God. Am I not good before you? Am I not doing what you told me to do? Am I not trying my best? I'm not like them. I'm not like the evil people. I even, I give I give a tenth of everything that I have to the church and I fast twice a week to show you that I'm committed to you. He's thinking he's, he's doing the right things. Verse 13, but the tax collector, he stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. You see this contrast in coming to God, right? This is what Jesus is teaching in the, par or in the, in the uh, Beatitudes. It's like, that's the difference. Those that come to God, like the second guy, the one that realizes, I am a sinner. Like, I don't deserve to be in your presence, God. But have mercy on me. That's that, those who mourn, right? That moment. And this is what Jesus said at the end of the story. He said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, he went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And I tell you what, go ahead and try. Exalt yourself before God. Don't do it, for real. Like, because that's what God does. He humbles the proud. And that process is never fun. I've gone through it. <laughs> Actually, I went through five years of it in a season of my life where I thought I was humble. God, thank you for helping me be so humble, right? And there was a sense of humility in me, but God had to discipline the pride out of my life and take me through some very hard times so that he could prepare me to use me. <clears throat> if you want to be proud, get ready to be humbled. But he says, and those who humble themselves, they will be exalted. He will lift you up. He will meet you and comfort you in the morning. He will raise you in his presence. You'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. You'll be a child of God, right? All these promises in the Beatitudes. And so I cannot, I cannot shrink back that truth for us in the gospel of what Christ has done for us. 
because the only reason we experience mercy is because of him. Amen? And so when we look at these Beatitudes and we look at that first part, I just want us to know that we know if we want to be raised up in God's presence, we have to walk into these promises and these Beatitudes and these characteristics in our heart before God. And then we start to see as we do that, these other things start building one on top of another. We start to see meekness in our life. Why? Because we've experienced mercy. We, we, start to, we start to see ourselves showing compassion to others. Why? Because we've received compassion from our God who loves us. Right? These become the natural overflow of our hearts because of our experience and our relationship with God. And then he keeps going. And these are the last ones in this part of the passage in the Beatitudes that he pushes into as we're building on to these truths. So back into Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 9. He says this. He said, Now, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, these are kind of contrasting statements again. Blessed, happy are, happy are the peacemakers. Now that one's like, okay, I get that one. Like, I can experience happiness and contentment. If if I'm a peacemaker, like, I'm experiencing peace in my life, there should be a sense of that. But then the second one is, happy are those who are persecuted. Whoa, whoa, whoa right? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about, Jesus? How can be happy and being persecuted? That doesn't make any sense. So let's look at these two, okay? So the, 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 the my, I'm already running out of words, and I have a whole other sermon to do, all right? So the, fir- the first one here is peacemakers. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I want to be called the children of God, right? That's the end of that promise. I want to be called that. I want to be in that fold. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, I, I, I don't have to go super deep into this one. I just want to define what, what a peacemaker is, okay? What does it mean to be a peacemaker in life? Um, because I'll, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people who do the opposite of, la, of that in our culture. There's plenty of news channels you'll watch, right? That, that'll actually have nothing to do with that because that doesn't sell, right? They, they want to create tense. They want to create conflict. They want to, that's what draws us into our, the TV shows we love is conflict, right? Like, oh man, oh, what's going to happen? Oh, they're ticked off of that person, that created that dude, murdered that guy. And oh, you know, get sucked in because it's conflict. So the media knows that our human nature gets curious in the conflict. The unfortunate thing is those who are immature then take and play that out in their workplace. They play that out in their home place. They're like, this is fun. Let's make conflict, Right? you're stupid, right? Like, don't do that. Sorry if that was harsh. But like, you know, it's just, we know some of those people. To be a peacemaker means it's, and this is the only place in scripture where this word peacemakers is used. I'm like, that's interesting. Hmm. Like this Greek word, the original word. And this is what it means. Tending to promote peace. Duh, right? Like, like, I was guessing that's what it meant. Like, that's not complicated. So I needed to look at what is the opposite of that then? Like, promoting peace is a great thing. What is the opposite? What does that look like so I can understand this more? So the opposite of being a peacemaker is being an agitator, an instigator, and a troublemaker, right? That's the opposite of a peacemaker. Somebody that's looking to create conflict. Do you know those people that love being the devil's advocate? Anybody know somebody like that? Like, do you live with them? And I apologize if you do, right? Like, or have you ever been in board meetings or staff meetings or at school? You're like, oh my gosh, devil's advocate. You are the devil, right? Like, stop advocating there. They're the people that love conflict, but they don't know why. And usually they love conflict because there's a sense of emotional comfort when there is conflict, because that's what they've experienced their whole life. So when there's not conflict, they don't know what to do with themselves, right? They don't, know how they, they, they don't know how to feel. They don't know how to respond. They don't know how to do anything else except for get into conflict or create conflict or tension. And, uh, and unfortunately, that's not helpful. Now, there is, there is a healthy conflict, right? There's a healthy time when you push into something because truth needs to be spoken And healthy conflict needs to be put into the conversation so that the best result can come out at the other side, right? Healthy conflict is good. Healthy conflict isn't self-motivated, though. It's motivated by the best outcome. It's motivated by the other person's success. It's motivated not by ego, but for the team or for the staff or for the circle of people you're around or for the family. That's healthy conflict. Those that just choose to agitate, instigate, and troublemake now that's, that's, the, that's the unhealthy. There is no conflict. I'm going to create some. 
Jesus is telling us, as Christ followers, it is for us to be the ones that promote peace. I want to share a difference with you, uh, because I don't know if a lot of people understand. The difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper, because there's a difference A peacekeeper typically is somebody that just wants to keep the peace at all cost, right? So a peacekeeper, I would say, is a passive position. And and let me describe it this way in our our household, our family. All right, so we've got three boys, 9, 12, 13. (laughs) I always feel bad for my children, but my dad was a preacher too, Nat, and I feel your pain, but, but they fight sometimes, right? Does anybody have kids? They fight sometimes. If I want to be a peacekeeper, if I just kind of want like, why don't they just, you know, just get over it? A peacekeeper will passively let the argument happen, not try to like jump in, use it as a teacher. They'll just kind of let it happen and, and then finally jump in and say, guys, just cut it out, stop it now. Because they're just trying to keep the peace in the house, right? It's kind of like, it's just in this, it's just be done. Urgh. And that's really a passive response out of self-protection. You're driving me nuts, shush, Right? That is, that's a peacekeeper mentality. I don't like conflict, so I'm going to do my best just to make sure everybody's okay, even though in reality, things aren't okay. A peacemaker in that instance would be somebody that says, man, these kids are arguing like crazy. I'm going to jump in and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is going on? And start asking questions to get down to the bottom line. What's happening here? Where's the truth here? Who did what? And you have bunch of different sides of the story a peacemaker is one that's going to say i need to teach you guys how to respond appropriately here your attitude is this and this and god would want it to be this and this so can you guys ask forgiveness of one another for your sinful attitude towards each other that's a peacemaker it's jumping into the conflict to say we need to make this right not just stepping out of it and hoping it goes away do you understand the difference between the two? Being a peacemaker is active. It's looking for opportunities not to agitate, not to create messes, not to bring more messes, but when there is a mess, to enter into it to bring truth and to bring peace. That's a peacemaker. That's difficult, right? That's difficult. We're warned in the scriptures in Romans 16 <clears throat> because I've seen this in church I've been in church a long time and just we're full of, we're messy people like churches are messy people and I've been in churches where there have been good well-intended Christians who have continually created agitation division and argument in the life of a church and I will say that is the devil's work that is the devil's work. Romans 6, 16, 17 says, watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way in the church because they're not living as peacemakers. They're usually trying to get their own agenda and they're trying to push it into the life of the church as a whole. We're called as Christ followers to bring unity and be peacemakers, meaning we're gonna dig into truth. We're gonna wrestle with truth together and we're gonna come out the other side. Does that make sense? So it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm going to tell you, the words of Jesus aren't easy. If they were easy, everybody would go to heaven. Right? Everybody would be perfect. Everybody, like, this isn't easy. But he calls us to it. He calls us to it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because they're going to be called children of God. They're going to look like the kingdom of heaven in this messy earth. Those are going to be the, the ones. Now let's look at the last um, one. Oh, wait. I have to read this. I'm running out of time. But this is so rich and so good. Um, In Titus 3, to get this point of idea of being a peacemaker, because this goes even culturally, not just the church, but culturally. I tell you, there's just so much noise in our culture today. I mean, political noise, opinion noise. Like, it's just like... I am not on social media. If you Facebook message me, I'm sorry. I'm not looking at it right now. Um, And I'm not scrolling all that much because it's just so much noise. And it's unfortunate to me that Christians, Christ followers, church attenders, right, are just as noisy as everybody else with their opinions. They're throwing it. 
And this is what it says in Romans 3.1. He says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. That's a peacemaker, right? It's one that's not trying to just be like, I have an opinion about this. I'm going to throw it out there. Rawr! The president shouldn't, blah, 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 right? And then it's like, Jesus. And they add Jesus to it. I'm like, stop saying Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't give a rip about politics. He doesn't. He's large and in charge, seated on the throne of the universe. He's more concerned about your soul than he is about a policy. And when people elevate political statements, when they elevate their own, uh, um, their own opinion above the word of God and the work of Jesus in their life, they're out of balance. Now I'm preaching, right? Why? Because I want to be known as a child of God in the kingdom of heaven that says, you know what? The authorities, they may be making stupid decisions and I may not agree with it and there may be right outlets to disagree, right? Right? I'm not saying, we, that's the amazing thing about America. You can disagree, but not get your head cut off. Go to other countries, see what happens, right? We have so much freedom. But in the process, we can't slander people. Uh, we, can, we can't just like say, well, screw them. They're the leaders, but they're screwing up, so I'm not gonna follow them. He says, no, 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 don't slander anyone. Be peaceable, be considerate. Always be gentle toward everyone. Why? Because when you go against that, when you start acting out against that, the gospel presentation in your life has been squashed. Why would anybody accept the Jesus in you when you're pushing against the politics in them? They won't. You're building a wall of the gospel. Don't do it. I don't know who that's for. Let's keep reading. At one time, we too were foolish. I love it. He just, the scripture don't pull any punches. Like, he's like, at one time, you were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Like, that's what I see right now in our culture. Like, that's what I see playing out. It's like, once you were that, you're not anymore. You're a Christ follower. That's, you don't belong to that kingdom. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. Why? But when the kindness of the love of God, of our Savior, appeared. When he showed up, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So because of what he's done in us, we become the reflection of God, Christ, the kingdom of heaven, to this broken world we live in. That's the image of being a peacemaker. Does that make sense? I about skipped all that. You can email me later if you disagree, but you'll be wrong. So let's keep going. Um, the last one. <laughs> I hope you know that we can be real people, right? Persecuted. He says, blessed, and this is the one we don't like. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He keeps going, verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, he says. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He's like, you're blessed if you're persecuted. Why? Because it means you're looking different than the world you live in. And they get confused. Why are you so peaceable when everything's so crazy? Why are you so happy and fulfilled when I hate my job and hate my life? I hate you because of it, right? Like, when you start living this way and looking this way, you're either going to become attractive to those that desire it or you're going to be offensive to those that hate it. And I know some of you experience this every single week. Right? For some of you, you put up with antagonistic people in your workplace because you're a Christian, because you're a Christ follower. Or at school, you get people like picking on you and saying things behind your back or... And when we feel those things, when we experience those things, and our natural like, tendency is to be like angry or like woe is me or like you better stop or I'm going to talk about you and say what you do. And, and so there's like self-protection in the midst of all that as well. And here Jesus said, no, 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 no. Happy are those that are persecuted. Happy? Rejoice and be glad in this, guys. Okay, I don't understand, Jesus. Help me understand this. Like, help me get this. How can I rejoice when people are attacking me? So when we look all throughout history, the history of the scriptures, 
um, we see this happening over and over again throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. Right? In the Old Testament, we see prophets. The prophet's job was to bring God's word to God's people. So this wasn't even about secular world. This wasn't even about like the lost world. Like this, these were Israel, God's chosen people in the Old Testament. And the prophets came and said, the Lord says this. And they hated them. Like they, they accused them of things. They, they killed a lot of them because of the message that, that they were bringing with God. They were persecuted big time. And that was them talking to people that were their own, you know? You see in the New Testament, and you see people like Paul, right? Paul's testimony is that he was beaten, abused, he was thrown in jail. Why? Because he was preaching the gospel. That's all he was doing. He was loving people, he was preaching, this is who Jesus is. And the authorities, the government, and the culture didn't like it. And so they throw him in jail. And then you see Paul's response in jail. While Paul and Silas were singing and praising God in the midst of in prison, a jailer comes to know Jesus who is watching and guarding them, wondering, why are you so different? And his whole household gets saved. Paul got this whole idea. It's a matter of where our um, citizenship lies, right? If our citizenship as a Christ follower, if we feel like it lies in the world we live in, we'll be so much more affected by the world we live in. If our citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven, when we experience persecution, we're so secure in that it's okay. It's okay. I can go through this. And to be honest with you, what we go through is cake in America. We, we are so spoiled with the freedoms that we have. I, I guarantee you go over the ocean and go to some lands that are full of sand and you start preaching the gospel of Jesus and see what happens. Just see what happens. You might become the sacrifice that day with your head cut off and body just carried through the, the town as people celebrate. Another Christian's dead. That's today. Like that's not like, that's like right now. And so when somebody says, oh, you're a Christian? And we go, I'm like, we're such weaklings in America. And our faith is so small compared to the others across this world. And what Jesus is teaching us, I'm not saying that to belittle us, okay? Because I know what we go through, what you go through, it is real. It's, I'm not saying it's not real. The emotions you go through, they're real. The persecution from others is real. Why? The enemy is out there doing his best to pull you down. He's the author of lies and that's what they try to do. This, this is what it said, right, in this, in this passage. Um, persecuted you and falsely say all kinds of evil things about you. The father of lies is trying to lie about you to everybody else, to accuse you. And when you have nothing to be accused of. And Jesus, and this is why he says, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In 1 Peter 4.14 we read these words, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, right? You are happy. Why? For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You have something so much greater. You are experiencing just a small, small little bit of Jesus' great persecution for us, right? And so he says, you can rejoice in that. You're in pretty good company the blameless, sinless Savior of the world was persecuted and hung on a cross. Why? Because he loved you. And he wanted you to have a relationship with God. And so he says, you can rejoice in that. You can rejoice in that. So this week, if you go through that, if somebody like talks talk smack behind your back, right? Or if somebody accuses you falsely of something that you didn't do, how can you choose joy, Right? How can you consider it all joy to be in that circumstance and let God bring a rejoicing spirit to your heart? In all of this, the beautiful thing is Jesus does all this in us. We don't have to do any of this in our own power. We don't have to be merciful by our own strength. It's not like, I'm going to be merciful, I'm going to be merciful, I'm going to be merciful, I'm going to be merciful. Good luck. <laughs> like, right? It's like, no, no, no. Christ is in us. The power of God and his presence in our life. 
the mercy and forgiveness we received, he is in us and gives us the power to walk into these beatitudes, to be humbled before him, to mourn for our sin, right? To be meek, to to be pure in heart. He can put in us as we walk with him this hunger and thirst for his righteousness in our life. And today's challenge is, are you going to be one that promotes peace, a peacemaker? And are you going to be one that rejoices even in persecution because of what Christ has done for you and for me? God, none of this is in our power, nor is any of it really in our own abilities We can't do this apart from you in us. The Holy Spirit's work through us. The salvation of Christ inside of us. And so I pray, God, that we would walk into your awesome invitation, which is to come before you humbly. That we would receive the words of Jesus and let them carry weight in our lives. Those of us in this room who are Christ followers, we've made our commitment to you We've confessed Christ as our Savior. We've given you our lives that you would start working these things in us. And as we hear truth, we put on truth and we live in it. God, I pray for those here this morning that don't know you, that don't have a relationship with you yet, and they haven't started this. I know right now they may be thinking, boy, this sounds hard. I pray, God, that you would show them it's easy when we're with you that it's not their own strength or power, but it's in the act of submitting our life to you that you raise us up. You fill us up and you draw us into your presence. Listen, the invitation, if you don't know Christ, the invitation is this. He says, come to me. (laughs) He says, confess Jesus as your Lord and you'll be saved it's not a it's not a magic prayer it's not like well pastor said to say this it is your heart humbled before God just saying I need you Jesus I need you Jesus I invite you into my life and I would encourage you if you need to take that step today take it I'm going to invite you to the freedom to do that this morning Um, we're going to sing a song and it's a song talking about giving us faith increasing our faith that we trust Jesus. We trust what he says. We trust what he does in us. As we do that, I'm going to invite all of us in the room to respond however you feel led to, whether it's just sitting, just contemplating, whether it's standing and worshiping and thanking him, whatever you need to do, I just ask you just let him lead as you respond and let him speak and challenge and encourage as we hear him. And so God, I pray that you would meet us here For those that need to know you for the first time and give their lives to you, I pray that they would just right now confess, I need you, Jesus, to be my Lord and Savior, and I give you my life. I pray for all of us who are Christ followers in this room, that you will bubble up these truths in our life, and that we'll have a sense of peace that can only come from you. So lead us in this moment, God. We're going to sing and respond.